Bonita Wala Vigilante, what's happening, good people? Today I have to give a talk on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. All right, so when we talk about the legacy of Dr. King, I think it's important to start with the introduction that I had to King as a young boy growing up in the city of Chicago. You can't really see from where you're sitting, but this is me right here. And if you look at my classroom, you can see that despite many years after the legacy of King, many years after the civil rights movement, we still have a very segregated space of learning. Now, sure, yes, you have black, you have Latino kids, uh, but in terms of diversity that, that King advocated for in his life, it wasn't quite there yet. We're still working towards that. And every year around this time, my teachers would start by talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. They would talk about his involvement with Rosa Parks and the Civil Rights Movement and the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Those were the preliminary talks that we had with regards to King and his legacy. And I had those introductions in elementary school, or what you would say primary school here in Antigua, and then also, this is me also here in high school, which you would call secondary school here in Antigua. So the very familiar narrative that came along with Dr. Martin Luther King were his highlights of his bio. Born January 5th, 15th, 1929, graduated from high school at 15, earned his BA in 1948, completed his doctorate in 1953. That is very significant in terms of understanding the the trajectory of this education, right? To get a doctorate degree, for most people, the average is anywhere between five years and, and 10 years, right? So right after his bachelor's degree, he went straight through to earn his doctorate degree. So that in itself says that, that King and what he represented was a very intellectual standpoint. So he valued, he valued education. That was very much so part of his foundation. And from that education background, we have his role that evolved, right? He was a pastor, Dexter, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Montgomery, Alabama, uh, but he also led the very significant and the commemorable Montgomery boycott between 1955 and 1956. But he had this lens of seeing himself as a pastor, as sort of an agent of God as he understood God, but also as an activist, as this, this, this part of him that was a calling for him to do something about racial injustices. From there, we really get to see King's legacy uh, take off, right? Not take off that fast, that went a little bit too fast. Uh, these are some of the highlights that come along with what we know about Dr. King. 1957, he began to work as Southern Christian Leadership Conference's president. He wrote five books. Uh, we know about his involvement with the uh, Selma March. You know, they had a movie uh, on March 7th. That was the first time they tried to cross uh, Selma. Uh, they had what we call, you know, what we know as Bloody Sunday, where there were many demonstrators that were, that were hurt, that were beat up, that were beaten, that were arrested, uh, that became Bloody Sunday because of the, the, the riot that came about as they tried to cross into uh, Selma. And then March 25th, we see him come together with thousands of supporters to actually cross over uh, that bridge. On April 28th, probably one of the, the keynotes that are often talked about is his I Have a Dream speech, right? I'm sure we've seen lots of clips, we've seen footage all over YouTube about this, this famous speech that he gave. We talked about having a dream. And then at 19, 1964, at age 35, he wins the Nobel Peace Prize for his many contributions to, to freedom, his involvement with organizations like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, his involvement with different marches that happened throughout the United States. This, these are the things that we know about King and that, that we remember and that we appreciate and that we value in his work and what he committed his life to. One of the lenses that he saw his work uh, he saw his work through the lens of being a Christian. And one of Christ's central messages, it's a message of love. And in that, 
This is one of the quotes that he, he's quoted as, as saying. To take it up the cross is a voluntary or deliberate choice of putting ourselves without reservation at the service of Christ and his kingdom. It is putting our whole being in the struggle against evil, whatever the cost, right? So he's interpreting the Christian message as a message of justice, as a message of hope, as a message of doing whatever it takes in order to bring about a just society. One of the other figures that was very instrumental in his life is Gandhi, right? Uh, the Satchidraha, the, the true love force, that was a part of his platform and how he went about his work, right? Gandhi was the guiding light of our technique of nonviolent social change. That was very central to his message. It built on the message that he understood that Christ represents it, right? So you have Christ and you have Gandhi as these figures that influence the ways that he goes about his marches, the ways that he goes about trying to bring about a more just society in the United States. In December of 1964, uh, he visits London and he gives a talk at the St. Paul's Cathedral. And he says, you know, I think it's necessary for the colored populations in Great Britain to organize and work through meaningful, nonviolent, direct action approaches to bring its issues to the forefront of the conscience of the nation, wherever they exist. In this, he's, he's talking about not only what's happening in London with the, the citizens that are identified as colored, but he's also talking about what's happening in British colonies, what's happening in the Caribbean, what's happening around the world where England has a huge uh, threshold in terms of power, in terms of dominance, in terms of influence in the culture, in terms of creating just laws. He's not only talking about what he's seeing in the United States, but he's talking about places where Great Britain has uh, colonial power and colonial reign within the world. Now here are some critiques of King's legacy. And these critiques are not often the, the things that we highlight during a Black History Month performance or a Black History Month program. We don't talk about the, the ways that, that King had some challenges, right? Uh, one of the critiques that he, that influenced his life as uh, he was going about these different marches was that, you know, King spoke to this colorblind ideology. He wanted us to move beyond race. And there's a space and place for it, but that wasn't the space and place for it at the time. I would argue that's still not where we need to be now. Uh, because in that ideology, we're saying that we're disregarding a significant point, a significant lens by which people of color may see themselves, understand themselves. And if you look about the different policies, you look about the different uh, laws, they have this racial lens to it that at times folks said King didn't want to really recognize, or he, he wanted us to look beyond that, when in reality, we have to look through that lens to understand where people are where they are, what, what they're going to do, and how they understand themselves in the world. The other thing that we don't have to talk about with King is that there were many allegations that he had adultery, that he, he committed adultery, that he had these relationships beyond the, the closed doors of the hotel rooms that he stayed in when he visited uh, these different cities to have marches. There was a, uh, a counterintelligence program, the Quarantel Program, led by J. Edgar Hoover. And what they did was they would record his conversations. They would find out this information about these relationships that really contradicted his public persona. We know King as a beacon of love, as, as a beacon of justice. But there was this other side of King that people did not want to talk about, that people were not really uh, happy about. Uh, one of the big critiques, public critiques, was Malcolm X. And he criticized King as saying, you know, he's, he's, he's not really thinking about what's practical. When you think about incidents like Bloody Sunday, where you know, people were bitten by dogs, they, they were hosed by uh, these, these firehouses. I mean, you think about the many different ways in which violence maintained the racial injustices in the United States. When you think about nonviolence, not, not responding to that, uh, Malcolm X challenged him in that. He said, you know, that's, that's not really effective talking about really trying to bring about justice. It's not that we're going out and trying to fight fire with fire, but we're realizing that there's a time and place for everything. There's self-defense, and then there's violent confrontation. And Malcolm X was saying, we have to understand that sometimes when you're dealing with violent people, when you're dealing with violent laws, when you're dealing with violent acts, 
The response in some cases is to respond with violence. So if we look at King and we talk about his legacy, uh, we often are framed in thinking about him through this lens of racial equality. We think about the image of him as being a part of this I have a dream moment on the states, uh, the steps of the Washington Monument. Uh, but when we really think and go beyond that, uh, he started off with racial equality, then he talked about Vietnam, war, and global injustices. And then before he passed away, he had moved on to looking at economic injustices, looking at the ways that uh, people were not being paid properly for their, their work, the conditions they had to work in. They were look, he was looking at the ways that economic policy, that it drove the different, different policies and laws that were not just and uh, practice in terms of trying to create a more equality uh, within the society. Now, when I first got this, 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 this invitation to, to talk about King, it took me back to uh, when I was in graduate school. And it was right around the time Barack Obama was uh, getting into office. And there were a lot of comparisons between Barack Obama and Martin Luther King. And at this point in time, I was leading a poetry set on the campus of the University of Illinois at Chicago, and they asked us to come and talk about King. And so we said, OK, we would do it. It was me and another, another guy who led the open mic sets. And we created this piece called Deferred Dream. And, and part of that was it was in remembering what King said, right? On Christmas Eve, 1967, he says, I'm the victim of a deferred dream of blast of hopes, but in spite of that, I close today by saying I still have a dream. So he's recognizing that while he has this dream, this dream of freedom, this dream of liberation, there's still so much more work that has to be done. And even at the height of the Obama election and, and what his, his legacy meant, uh, there were still some challenges that, that, that were with us, that are continue to be with us today. And so I wrote this poem, and it's in my, my latest book, where I, I talk about King's dream. And again, this, this piece, it comes out of that, that hype around what Obama would represent in the United States. And so I'm going to share that poem with you now just to give you an idea of where, where I was at the time in understanding King's dream, but also thinking about, okay, what can we do moving forward as we think about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. So the poem is called King's Dream Deferred. I still have a dream that, that one day these indifferent notions will transcend this ghetto pathology, form by white supremacy, laced with freedom and call democracy. I'm hoping that Obama, Obama, will not be a puppet for the powers that be. Following his change, I unused the terminology for people who resemble me. An endemic, epidemic to communities of color. My dreams and in reality. So I shared this poem, I was in graduate school, and after I, I read that poem, the MC of the event came up and said, whoa, 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 I hear what you're saying. We still got a lot of work to do, but let's not undermine the legacy of King. And that is not my intention by any means. I want us to understand that King stood for a lot in his lifetime. He marched, he brought about changes, right? The Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, we, these, are, these are aspects of his legacy. But we also have to realize that there's always there's always more work to be done. So King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. There's, there's talk about, okay, was it James Earl Ray or was it someone else? James Earl Ray working in cahoots with the FBI. Uh, James Earl Ray, Earl Ray mentioned someone by the name of Raul that was later tracked down. And then there were allegations that there was a Memphis police officer who was like a sharpshooter who, all, who did this work in order to, 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 kill, uh, to kill King. But as I say here, I want us to, to remain hopeful, to know that it's our responsibility, especially when I think about AUA and the work that we're doing. This is a quote that, that came from King after a march in Chicago, in my hometown, where I first been introduced to King, where he says, and this is after an event, a protest where they're, they're discussing economic rights, he says, we're concerned about the constant use of federal funds to support this most, the most notorious expression of segregation. 
of all the forms of inequality. Injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. I see no alternative to direct action and creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of the nation. So it's our responsibility as educators, as students, to continue knowing that these are King's words, that as we work in healthcare, as we work in medical education, that we must continue this fight. We must continue to, to make that dream, that famous dream. We have to make that become a reality. And we do that by doing our best work to become the physicians that are caring, that are looking to, to help people from underserved communities. Because, yes, it's 2023, but that racial divide continues to exist. It's 2023, but we still have inequalities in many communities. And access to health care is, is probably at the crux of a lot of our issues that we continue to face as a nation. Because as King is saying, we think about the most inhumane because it often resolves, results in physical death. If we don't have life, then, then what do we have? And so that's, that's my call today. As I think about the legacy of King, I think about what did his life mean? Was he perfect? Absolutely not. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes, right? But he represented this hope, this idea of what freedom and love can be. And that's our goal. That's what we should be striving to, is to continue to work a little bit better every single day to get towards this idea of freedom and love. There will be struggle, there will be challenges, but again, we must continue, continue to, to fight the fight that's going to bring it back bring about the, the impact and change that we want. All right? That's all I have. Any questions? All right, so I just did my talk on MLK and mixed feelings about it. Parts of it I think went really well. I had some issues with technology. My pointer didn't link up to the laptop like I wanted it to. Uh, there are some things that I said that I wanted to say a little bit differently, but I, that, that just comes along with having these presentations. Some days they rock, they sound perfect. Other days it's like, okay, I could have did that better. I could have did this better. I could have did that different. This is one of the days where I thought, hmm, did okay, but there's some things I could definitely change for the next time that I, I do this presentation. So it is what it is.